I think we're going to go straight over to David and yeah, I can just feel there's a lot coming through from the spirit and this morning I just was having all of these parables come into me around just opening up to divine providence and just the one key idea I want to share before I pass the mic over was um, yeah, like just when uh, Helen was working with, with Jesus and she was scribing the course and there was a point where she wanted some, some, some green pantyhose and a used Borgana coat. And um, because they had such an important function to get on with, Jesus was like, you know, <laughs> can you imagine? He has this whole course of miracles that he's trying to get through this channel. <laughs> it's taking seven years. <laughs> and she's like, I really need green pantyhose <laughs> and a used Borgana coat. And so, he took her shopping and he got, he guided her where to go to get the green pantyhose and get that used organic coat as swiftly as possible so that they could get back into their, their mission with, with scribing the course. And that's just a beautiful parable about when you start giving yourself over and accepting this plan, the Holy Spirit's plan, then you start to, be guided in these swift ways by the Holy Spirit where your needs start to be being met because the Holy Spirit wants you to get on with your function and be freed up to get on with your function. Mm -hmm. And that's like a key. When we say, I want to serve, I want to be in my purpose, then we start to witness what divine providence is as it comes up underneath to support itself. So over to you, David. <laughs> mm, thank you. Yeah, that's a great parable uh, from Absence from Felicity because um, what that parable illustrates is that even while you believe you have specific needs in this world, the Holy Spirit, Jesus, will meet those specific needs. And so that kind of echoes what I was sharing last night about how divine love has, has always met and will always meet every human need. Not that the needs are real. Remember, the human being is a construct. The human being is, is made up. So there aren't any real needs in heaven and God doesn't even know about needs, but the Holy Spirit is the bridge to help the mind wake up and remember God, remember heaven, and so the Holy Spirit seems to meet needs. Not that the Holy Spirit is like an active participant in the world, but the, we could say the Holy Spirit uses the symbols of the world that the ego made to unwind the mind from the belief in those symbols, or from the belief in linear time. And the fear of awakening, the fear of redemption, is projected onto the world. So when you think back to the past and you think of all the, the fearful things that you can think of in the past, then those are memories and those memories get used by the ego to be projected into the future and then they seem like future outcomes and future scenarios and yet it's just the ego using past and future to defend against the holy instant. So we're just going to talk today about divine providence because divine providence is really the way that you start to learn to develop trust and go deeper and deeper in, in your mind toward the holy instant. Also that example that Kirsten just gave, um, not only did she, Helen Shuckman, in the middle of the scribing process, want a used Borgana coat, which is a used winter coat in New York City, which is not the smallest of the cities and villages on the earth. Uh, it was New York City and, and it was a winter coat and, um, and she did want green pantyhose and so those were specific requests and you can see that Jesus answered her by guiding her, telling her where to go to buy that 
for it, not only used, but she had another parameter on that. She, she would only pay a certain amount of money. So Jesus had to find in New York City a used organic coat that was only a certain amount of money. She wouldn't pay more than a certain amount. And basically, why is that even important is because it was for saving time. Helen had such an enormous resistance to the light that uh, she had a great scribal ability, but it, because of all the fear in the mind and all the resistance, it took seven years from 1965 to 1972 to take down in shorthand A Course in Miracles. And a lot more time to, of course, if you talk about typing, they had to type out the shorthand and uh, yeah, it was, then there was an editing process and lots of things that went with that. So what that again shows is that the Holy Spirit's guidance and Jesus' guidance to you as part of that divine providence can be very specific. But you must also note that when you're opening to hear guidance and, and opening to this uh, form of divine providence, of receiving guidance, that there's enormous fear to hearing specifics. Why would there be enormous fear of hear, hearing specifics except that that the ego fears loss of autonomy and the ego basically doesn't want anyone telling it what to do. So you see what the threat is, if you start hearing specifics from the Holy Spirit, the ego is just going to be going, not good at all. Because those specifics are part of instructions that are designed to undo the ego and the ego doesn't want to be undone. So that's why there's a fear of hearing specifics. There have even been Course in Miracles teachers that say, well, you can't really hear the Holy Spirit. That's just a metaphor. He's just a, a bright light in your mind that's there to comfort you and bless. That's not what Jesus is teaching. And I'm surrounded by an entire community here uh, of 30, some 38, 39 people. And basically everyone is encouraged to open up and listen to the guidance and that's what helps make it a dance. You can imagine 39 people <laughs> interacting without guidance. What a mess. I don't think we would stay in community very long if we had 39 people with uh, 39 perceived egos uh, contesting with each other each day. You know, that is very, very difficult. But actually we do encourage opening up and hearing the guidance and hearing, even if there's specific guidance, and also following that guidance, and that's part of our divine providence. And it's not just for, uh, just in recent times, you know, we have had this community going for years, and so that's why we'll try as best we can to answer some of your questions on divine providence, which actually hearing from some of the elders in the community who have been flowing and, and living in this divine providence for years, they've, they have answered the call, they have said yes to God, they have been taking those steps and those many steps that uh, Michael was talking about, the, they've been taking these steps for years, so they are very um, used to this. This is not some kind of a rare thing where, you know, somebody comes in the community and they come into a meeting and go, oh my God, I, I heard some guidance. Like it's this rare thing that uh, never happens. They say, actually I was guided to do this and this and this and this. And then, you know, it's a very, there's a very uh, much of an acceptance tone with the guidance. It's not some kind of, seen as some kind of supernatural sign from God that's so rare, it actually is part of our daily life and our daily experiences. And we, we do receive lots of guidance and we pray together and it's, it's not scary at all. It's actually very natural. And it actually is why we perceive a, a divine flow, a divine dance with everything. So to set the stage for our talk on divine providence, because I know a lot of you have asked, you know, what is divine providence? Can you give examples? What's the basis for divine providence? And we've talked about trust and that uh, 
all human needs are met in, in this trust. And then we could say even that state of mind need, really the mind's only need is to know its natural state of peace and joy and happiness. And really there's only one need, that's the only need the mind has, is to recognize itself and recognize that natural state of, of love and joy and grace. That's the divine providence. There's only one need, and that need has already been met. And when we open up to the experience of who we are, then through forgiveness we actually realize that we don't have any needs at all. But this is a very practical course, so while you believe in linear time, and while you believe you have needs, the Holy Spirit will meet those needs as a way of taking you in back to that point of that I am presence that is prior to the belief in needs, because it's prior to the belief in lack. So the whole point's to unwind from these beliefs in need and scarcity and lack and guilt and unwind to the point where you can go back far enough to come to this pristine state of I amness that is prior to time. And as Jesus taught in the Bible, before Abraham was, I am. That's the whole point, is coming to know thyself. That's really what all of this is about. So Divine Providence we could say is, is still a stepping stone idea, it's still uh, temporary. It's not like in heaven that God and Christ are telepathically saying, oh isn't it so great that we have divine providence and all our needs are taken care of. There aren't any needs, so they don't even know what divine providence, providence doesn't have a meaning in heaven. It's just I amness, it's just pure beingness, this isness, it's oneness, it's love. It, there is no divine providence. There's, we, we wouldn't even put those words together because everything is divine in heaven. Everything is spirit. But for what we're talking about, it's very, very, very practical. So if I put it in simple terms, if we're going to discover the experience of divine providence, we have to discover that that there's only one law, and that law is the law of love. And so you can see how it's very important to open up to that. If, if that's the law of creation, and it's the law of love, then it's not complicated. There aren't five laws, or seven laws, or ten laws. It's, there's only one. So it's the simplest thing that could be. This one law is the law of love. And then the ego, which is the belief in separation from that love, or separation from God, has made up many, many different laws. And, and among those are, are scarcity and lack, because to not know who you are as divine love is what the belief in lack is about. And then it takes many forms. And and when the mind is asleep and dreaming, it believes in those many forms, those many different laws. So, in my own experience of working with the Course, I will tell you, I'll give you some tips and hints of things that helped me come into this experience of the, the one law of love. And, and I like it actually when Jesus gets specific. You know, I, I grew up Christian, and so I had read the red words in the Bible, including, I am with you always, even unto the end of time. And I loved the feel underneath those words, the presence of love underneath them. But I was also uh, interested in, in the nuts and bolts of, of forgiveness, of healing. And uh, last night, uh, Kirsten mentioned something from the Bible, take no thought of what you should wear or what you should eat. I, that's fascinating. Take no thought for what you should wear or eat. Tell me more. Tell me more. What, give me some more of that. Um, I like the feel of I will love you even to the end of time, but I want more of 
how, how do I live and take no thought for what I should wear or eat? That's what I want to know. Let the morrow take care of the morrow. Oh, wow. That's, there goes the planning aspect of this world. Tell me more about that. How do I let the morrow take care of the morrow? You know, I want to know more. So when I was asking those questions of Jesus, uh, I was using the Course a lot of times as an oracle and just popping the book open. And I know I was asking these kind of questions that a lot of you are asking for this weekend with Jesus, and I just popped open the Course. And this is what I popped open to. It was Lesson 50 from the workbook. I am sustained by the love of God. Listen to this first sentence. This is like, it's pretty strong. Here is the answer to every problem that will confront you today and tomorrow and throughout time. How's that? Uh, he gives you one line, I am sustained by the love of God, and then he says, here is the answer to every problem that will confront you today and tomorrow and throughout time. Right there should give you a hint of what we're talking about this weekend and how important Divine Providence is as a theme. Because it's like if you come into an experience of being sustained by the love of God, you're finished with the ego. You're finished with problems. You're finished with time. <laughs> Today and tomorrow and throughout time. It's such a universal answer. He's basically saying that this being sustained by the love of God is, is the answer to everything. Every problem you will ever experience in time. In this world you believe you are sustained by everything but God. Your faith is placed in the most trivial and insane symbols. Pills, money, protective clothing, influence, prestige, being liked, knowing the right people, and an endless list of forms of nothingness that you endow with magical powers. This is sweet to my heart because I'm into practicalities. I love all the love talk, but please, if I am invested in something, that is holding me back from knowing my divine love, give it to me straight. Don't hold back, please give it to me straight. This is one of those give it to me straight um, lessons. All these things are your replacements for the love of God. All these things are cherished to ensure a body identification. They are songs of praise to the ego. Do not put your faith in the worthless. It will not sustain you. Only the love of God will protect you in all circumstances. It will lift you out of every trial and raise you high above all the perceived dangers of the world into a climate of perfect peace and safety. It will transport you into a state of mind that nothing can threaten, nothing can disturb, and where nothing can intrude upon the eternal calm of the Son of God. Put not your faith in illusions. They will fail you. Put all your faith in the love of God within you, eternal, changeless, and forever unfailing. This is the answer to whatever confronts you today. Through the love of God within you, you can resolve all seeming difficulties without effort, and ensure confidence. Tell yourself this often today. It is a declaration of release from the belief in idols. It is your acknowledgement of the truth about yourself. So, what Jesus is telling us is all these made-up beliefs, and he's rattled off some of them. Some of them seem to be physical things, some of them seem to be psychological things. He's saying, they're all idols, they're all made-up ego beliefs to distract you from knowing who you are. It reminds me of the Matrix. 
you know, where Morpheus tells Neo, the world was pulled over your, mind, your eyes to blind you from the truth. The idols have been made by the ego as a veil to blind the mind from the truth, to blind the mind from the light of true knowledge, of knowing who you are. Well, then I was guided to lesson number 76, and that lesson is like a corollary. That lesson goes completely with, I am sustained by the, the love of God, because it's just restating that lesson, I think, in another way. And the lesson is stated, I am under no laws but God's. And to say that is, it sounds sentimentally wonderful, but I'm more interested in the specifics. Like, okay, that's nice to know I'm under no laws but God's, but, but sometimes if I experience myself as a human being, it seems quite different. It seems like I am under some other laws and I've accepted them so much that I don't even question that, you know. You know, when somebody comes to you and they say, do you got the money? You know, usually people say yes or no. They don't launch into a philosophical discussion. Well, let's look at that. What is money? Imagine going to a bank or to a mortgage company or to a bill collector and saying, let's just explore this together. Now, what is a bill? What is, what is money owed? What does that mean? You know, they, they probably would call in a psychiatrist and say, Ref referral uh, for this person needs help. They are mentally deranged. <laughs> They're trying to, to ponder what the meaning of a bill is and money and instead of paying it. Uh, and you can see where that would not seem practical to someone who believes in that. But he's going to talk about this, I am under no laws but God's. We have observed before, he's talking about <laughs> lesson 50, we have observed before how many senseless things have seemed to you to be salvation. Each has imprisoned you with laws as senseless as itself. You are not bound by them. Yet to understand that this is so, you must first realize salvation lies not there. So he's telling us straight up, salvation lies not in idols. Salvation lies not in, in ego beliefs. These are make-believe, these are fiction, and as long as you're holding on to the fiction of idols, then you actually believe in those idols. And you believe that salvation or happiness, we'll say, results in attaining or accumulating or maintaining those idols. That's why for most people, I know we have a worldwide audience, but growing up in America, they were, they were always talking about the American dream. What is the American dream? That's why you have to have a career. Oh, okay, why do I need a career? Because if you want the American dream, if you want the house, you want the cars, if you want the children, if you want the, the animals, the pets, if you want the restaurants, if you want the shopping malls, if you want the vacations, ah, ah, this is more than an American dream, <laughs> I'll tell you. This is like a dream of the world. It's, some people even call it the good life, and it's going to cost you. People would say, the good life will cost you. You should pursue it, and it's going to cost you, so don't think it's just going to drop in your lap, or just you'll twinkle your nose and then you've got the good life. No, you're going to have to work for it, but if you work hard for it, you can have the good life, and then of course you'll grow old and get sick and die. But that's not emphasized, the last part. It's the part with the houses and cars and all the good stuff, that is emphasized, not the sickness and death. And then if you work hard enough, you will attain these things, and like some others, you will have a, your taste, your version of the good life, whatever that version is. Basically, Jesus is telling us, Salvation lies not there. That, that kind of, that's the ego's happy dream. 
and salvation isn't there. It's just another trick. You'll get there to that point and then you'll go, what's next? Or, okay, nice, but there's got to be more. There's still going to be some discontent, there's still going to be something underneath. And some of you out there, you know what I'm talking about. You've got, you've reached some pinnacles. I see, I see you nodding there, yep, yep. The eyes are sparkling, there's some smiling faces. You've reached some of those pinnacles and what? It didn't completely satisfy you. I don't think you'd be on this broadcast if you were completely satisfied. I don't, why would you even need an online retreat if you were completely satisfied? Maybe just to share the joy. That's possible. I'm not going to question your motives. But I see you sparkling there because some of you have actually had a pretty good taste of achieving those dreams in some way or another. Some of you are going, oh, I wish. No, I, I'm still on the, the wheel. I'm still <laughs> spinning the wheels going in that direction. But Jesus is telling us, regardless, that salvation lies not there. He tells us very directly, he says, while you would seek for it in things that have no meaning, you bind yourself to laws that make no sense. So he's telling us, that's the problem. If you're seeking for things, outcomes, goals of the world, and we were taught to have goals. Most of us were taught not to just sit and om and meditate all day. We were taught to go for your goals, achieve, accomplish, you know, make something of yourself, carve out your niche in the world and, and get, make something useful of yourself. Go out and work and achieve and accumulate and save. Okay, save, 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 save for a rainy day, and then, oh, the rainy day comes, and spend, 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 spend. Have fun spending. Just go shopping on a rainy day, you know? That'll get you out of the blues for maybe a few minutes. But, you know, basically saying, while you seek for it in things that have no meaning, you bind yourself to laws that make no sense. In other words, the answer to scarcity is not stuff. Stuff is not the answer to scarcity. Stuff is not the answer to lack. And some of you know this because you've tried it like, you've got a lot of stuff and you still feel you're lacking. So you can say, yeah, I've tried it. The ego tricked me. It, it said I, if I would just get stuff, I would not have this hole of lack anymore and I would be, I would feel complete, I would feel satisfied. But remember what Mick, Mick Jagger said, I can't get no satisfaction. And I've tried, and I've tried, and I've tried, and I've tried, I can't get no. So this is wise. That was his greatest contribution to the plan of awakening was <laughs> leaving us with a song that's saying he couldn't find satisfaction. And he did try. How many times? Four times. <laughs> he tried four times and he couldn't get, get any satisfaction. So basically this is, Jesus is giving us the answer and, and he's saying that's been the problem. You're seeking for things that really have no meaning and then you're binding your mind to laws that have no meaning and why is that a problem? It's because there's only one law, and that's the law of love. And when you bind your mind to ego, make-believe, fictitious laws, then you are covering over the only law that there is, which is the law of love. Love is all there is, and it's the only law there is, and that's because God is very simple. God doesn't create many laws, He just creates one. And when we're not aware of it, we're not happy. And then we do a lot of strange things. Forgive them for they know not what they do, Jesus said from the cross. We, we pursue crazy things. And then he says, thus do you seek to prove salvation is where it is not. You seek to prove you can find salvation in the form, in the things, in the stuff, when actually the kingdom of heaven is within you. It's a state of mind 
that's the small still voice guiding you into this still place of mind that will satisfy you, that is your natural state, that is where you are one with the law of love, that that is the only law that there is. So this is very, very profound. It's telling us don't seek outside yourself, don't, don't look for the solution into form. And that's very important when we start to talk about Divine Providence because if you tap in to the Spirit, then you will feel this sense of contentment, you will feel this sense of, of my needs are met. Even while I have make-believe laws and I believe in the laws of the ego, if I follow this spark within and I learn to trust and follow this guidance within, I will feel and experience as if I have no problems. Because the, the problems are so frequently and consistently handled by the guidance that you will lose track of, of this crazy idea that you have problems at all. And those will start to fade in awareness, fade and fade from your mind. I'll give you a tip too, it's really about coming to the present moment because all ego problems are hypothetical problems that are of the past or the future. They're always of past memories of something that went wrong as in your perception or judgment or future projections of those memories and conditions as if they could happen again and then that generates worry and anxiety about an impossible future that isn't really there from an impossible past that really is over and gone already. That's what guidance does, it takes you into the holy instant to show you that the past never was and the future will never happen because it's just a projection of the past. And if the past is not real, then the future isn't real either and then you realize love and light is all that you have and are. But here's, he gets specific. Today we will, be, we will be glad you cannot prove it, for if you could, you would forever seek salvation where it is not and never find it. The idea for today tells you once again how simple is salvation. Look for it where it waits for you, and there it will be found. Look nowhere else, for it is nowhere else. And here's where I love it the most because he gets very specific. I love it when Jesus gets specific. Think of the freedom and the recognition that you are not bound by all the strange and twisted laws you have set up to save you. You really think that you would starve unless you have stacks of green paper strips and piles of metal discs. You really think a small round pellet or some fluid pushed into your veins through a sharpened needle will ward off disease and death. You really think you are alone unless another body is with you. That's, that's pretty profound. You really think you are alone unless another body is with you. It, that we have this idea that, that there's connection is dependent on bodies, on companionship, on relationship of bodies, and that we could never be, feel loved and fulfilled unless we have a companion, unless we have a partner. That's a belief, that's an ego belief, that's an idol. And, and the truth is that the law of love is where that connection is, it's in, in our mind. But we've been bamboozled, we've been fooled to believe in these laws of the ego and that's where the, the heartbreak comes in, the sadness, the loneliness. And then he goes on to say, it is insanity that thinks these things. You call them laws and put them under different names in a long catalog of rituals that have no use and serve no purpose. You think you must obey the laws of medicine, of economics, of health. Protect the body and you will be saved. These are not laws but madness. The body is endangered by the mind that hurts itself. 
Let's go over that one again. The body is endangered by the mind that hurts itself. It's the mind that believes these false laws. It's the mind that believes in these idols. It's the ego that has projected this world of time and space and bodies and it's using what it projected as a trick to keep the mind distracted from looking within. It's using all these idol images as a big drama, as a big cloud, as a big smoke screen to keep the focus on the body. Why? Because the ego is the belief in a body identification and that's in the mind. And the ego doesn't want to, you to question the belief that you're a body. It wants you to frantically go around and try to control all these projected images to relieve the pain and the fear and the sadness and the doubt that you're experiencing in your mind. It even projects the feelings onto the body. It will project pain, psychological pain, onto the body and make it appear in a trick like physical pain. It will project fatigue, which is in the mind, onto the body and then you say, oh my body is tired. It's a puppet. It's like saying, my puppet is tired. What does that even mean? But you see how that's the trick. It's to always strengthen this false body identification, which is just a belief in the mind, which is just one of these false idols and beliefs. He says, the body suffers just in order that the mind will fail to see it is the victim of itself. Wow, that's that sentence. We could have said that sentence back in our uh, uh, sickness and uh, level confusion uh, online retreat we did recently. The body suffers just in order that the mind will fail to see it is the victim of itself. It's a distractor device to put the focus on the body and then to not look at the mind or its thoughts and beliefs. And the mind is the victim of itself. In other words, the mind is the victim of believing in the ego, believing in something, laws other than God's. And it's just using the body as a, like a, a, a side show. It's using the body as a distraction. It's, it's trying to pull the old bait and switch. Forget about your mind, focus on the body, and then fix the problems that the body faces every day, but never look within at the belief that you are a body. Never look within at the belief in lack. Never look within to the belief in scarcity. You know, some of you remember in the Bible where um, Jesus was confronted with this idea of, of hunger and thirst. Remember the woman at the well? And um, she was going to uh, bring him some water and she was stunned when out of Jesus' mouth came the words, drink of me and you will never thirst again. Oh, she didn't see that one coming. The whole world didn't see that one coming. He wasn't identifying the thirst as a body thirsting. He was saying, drink of me, drink of eternal life and you will never thirst again. That was a huge reversal and you start to see that everything about this world, all the laws, these false fictitious laws are all backwards and upside down. They all assume that the problem is in the form and deny that the problem is in the mind. They basically are teaching that you are the, a victim of an external world. When your body's thirsty, your mind doesn't feel well. When your body's hungry, your mind doesn't feel well. When your body's in pain, your mind doesn't feel well. It's not telling you that the mind is generating the thirst, the hunger, the pain. It's teaching you that you are at the mercy of an external world. And all of us have grown up with this belief. That's why we have education, to overcome all of these external forces. 
scarcity and lack. We need education. We need good jobs. We need good careers. We need all this focus and energy. Work, work, work. Do, do, do. Run, run, run. Rat race. Run on the hamster wheel. Run, run. I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm busy. Even in spiritual community, the ego will try to trick you into thinking that you're a spiritual doing and the, if you don't do enough as a spiritual doer, then you'll get dropped off. You'll be cast out. You won't make the grade. You'll never be a spiritual person unless you're a good enough spiritual doer person. And that's another trick. That's just the same version of the same trick that the ego uses with every one who believes in this world. The body's suffering is the mask the mind holds up to hide what really suffers. It would not understand it is its own enemy, that it attacks itself and wants to die. So this is describing the deceived mind, the mind that has forgotten heaven, that seems to have fallen from grace. It doesn't want to acknowledge its own suffering. So it, it wants to project it to the world and convince itself, mm, things aren't that bad. You know, all right, my body's breaking down. All right, I don't have a partner. All right, I have no money in my bank account. All right, I have a flat tire. All right, my world is a mess and it's falling apart. All right, all right. But it's not so bad. There are people who have worse conditions than me. You see, the ego is always going to try to use the world to say, it's terrible, but it's not that bad. It's the human condition. And basically, it would not understand it's, it is its own enemy, that it attacks itself and wants to die. It is from this your, quote, laws would save the body. It is for this you think you are a body. It's like a, it's a twisted game of trying to use these make-believe images and these idols to try to not face the, the heartbreak in the mind of believing that you're separated from God. The spiritual journey is just saying, no, I would rather look and expose this crazy belief that I'm separate from God. I would like to expose all the ego's crazy thoughts and beliefs and release all of them so that I may know that I'm one with my source. And that's what the mind training is about. When we talk about spiritual community, there's nothing special about spiritual community. There's nothing special about a group of bodies that seem to be in proximity with each other. In fact, if you went on Google and you just Googled the history of spiritual communities, you could read about these wacky things that have been going on for centuries. And they're pretty wacky. I mean, it's pretty wacky. I don't know that I would, any of us even thought that we would even be involved in a spiritual community. If you ask most of us years ago, we would say, what is that? What's that? We don't even know what a spiritual community is. But now we do the research and we go, wow, that's wacky. That's a <laughs> <laughs> and some of our experiences have been kind of wacky uh, too. We, we didn't know what we were walking into. Again, if you have 39 egos interacting with each other every day, that would be wacky. That's, you, some of you have been in relationships with two, it's seemingly two egos, really it's just one ego belief system, but you know how wacky those interpersonal relationships are. Multiply that by like 19, and that's 19 times the wackiness of your craziest interpersonal relationship. It's absurd. You wouldn't even attempt such a thing unless there was some purpose for it, like undoing the ego. Now he gets, it gets really good though. Now he's given us all the dynamics of what's going on underneath it. He says, he's so positive, he comes back, there are no laws except the laws of God. This needs repeating over and over until you realize it applies to everything that you have made in opposition to God's will. Isn't that optimistic? Isn't that loving? There are no laws except the laws of God. He's, that's, oh my God, that's the lesson. That's what we're on. I am under no laws but God's. He's like, it's like uh, we're all just like little infants and he's got this little rattle and he's going, and our eyes are going. 
And then finally we go. <laughs> so that's what this whole weekend is about. Your eyes have been going like this. And now, hopefully, after this weekend, I am under no laws but God's. I am sustained by the love of Oh, because you see your eyes may drift a little, but then they're going to... Jesus is rattling the truth. He is rattling the truth for us. He is saying, pay attention. Remember, there are no laws except the laws of God. That's what divine providence is, is this rattle that's saying, there are no laws but God's laws. You think that you can make up something that's in opposition to God's will. You think that you can make up something that's in opposition to heaven in opposition to nirvana, in opposition to oneness, he's like, no, actually that's pretty crazy. It's actually insane to think that you can make up laws that aren't God's laws. It's like God, the creator of, of love, of spirit, of oneness, of all that is real, and then there's this arrogant little idea that thinks, no, I can do better. I can make up some other laws. And he's basically saying, no, it's not possible. Now, he says also, the laws of God can never be replaced. We will devote today to rejoicing that this is so. It is no longer a truth we would hide. We realize it is, instead, it is a truth that keeps us free forever. And then he gives us time to come back to that, to watch the rattle and everything, and then he goes, okay, we will begin the longer practice periods today with a short review of the different kind of laws we have believed we must obey. These would include, for example, I love it when he's specific, you know, he really drives it home. These would include, for example, the laws of nutrition. Does anybody here believe in nutrition? That's an ego law. Nutrition. Now he's really getting specific. What do you mean about cholesterol? Carbs? Protein? I'm putting these things in. These are the laws of nutrition. <laughs> this is what we have believed in. Fat. Polyunsaturated fats. Did any of you ever read the ingredients at the supermarket? I went through that phase. I went through that phase. I would, I would spend more time in a supermarket reading the ingredients than having holy encounters with all my brothers and sisters in the aisle, concerned about how fast I could get through the checkout line with all of these things after I spent most of my time reading ingredients. And then here in one lesson, in one word, he's talking about nutrition. That's, an, that's a law of the ego. Immunization. That's a law of the ego. He's got it right here in the book. I'm not making it up. I'm not lying. It's actually here. Medication. Boy, that covers a lot. Nutrition, immunization, medication and of the body's protection in innumerable ways. Anything that you're using that's designed to protect the body is part of a make-believe system to keep you from not knowing the law of love. Anything. Anything that's defensive. Medical insurance, health insurance, Life insurance, protect the body, I mean, I never could get that, you know, the, the body's going to die and now you're going to have life insurance, so you're, you're betting, you're making a wager that your body's going to die and that's how you collect on the life insurance policy by dying. Is that absurd? Making a bet against yourself, making a bet that the body will die and the only way that any that you collect is by dying. I don't get it, you know. I never did get that one. 
I really never had life insurance. You can tell I did not. I didn't go for that one. Think further. You believe in the laws of what? Friendship. <laughs> Friendship. Friendship is a law of the ego. Yes, it does involve bodies, but come on, Jesus, Jesus Christ. Friendship of good relationships. Uh-oh, now you're on to it. You're telling me that the relationships I believe I have that are good relationships, as opposed to the bad ones, we're talking about the good ones, are part of our idols? My good relationships on planet Earth are idols? He's saying, yep, yeah, that the ego made up the laws of friendship. Frequency of contact. How long, how long, many times do you call them? How often do you text? Do you have a good relationship with your mother? Good relationship with your father, your children? It's based on all kinds of, of things in form the frequency of contact and so forth. That's a big deal. The ego of why do you feel guilty about not texting enough or not calling enough or why do you feel guilty about not returning a call except you have egoic laws of friendship in your mind that are idols that block the one universal law, the law of love. Now that's getting pretty specific. I remember the first time I read this, I was like, oh my God, my good friendships, my good relationships and my friendships are, are part of an ego system that is meant to blind me from the truth of divine love. That's really getting down to some very interesting details. Perhaps you even think that there are laws which set forth what is God's and what is yours. Many, quote, religions have been based on this. They would not save but damn in heaven's name. You know, this is when you, you're part of a theology where it tells you, this is God's, this is yours, and, and that you can somehow violate God. That you can violate God. Listen, if God is one, and God is eternal, and God is love, how are you going to violate eternity? Do you really believe you, you can be so arrogant to think that you can violate eternity? You imagine a little time creature called a human being, afraid and guilty that it will violate eternity. I mean, I, I was part of Christianity, and, and some of the stuff I would be talking to people and they would be going, uh-oh, watch it, that's, that could be blasphemy. And I would say, blasphemy? What's blasphemy? That's taking God's name in vain. And I would say, what's this all about? And they say, well, you know, God is going to be really offended if you take his name in vain. They would, they would never really tell me what God's name was. I'd say, well, okay, I'll be careful. What is, is it Jehovah? Is it, you know, is it just God? You know, it, what is it? And, and so they would almost be like, that's a sin to take God's name in vain. But if God's eternal, how can a time creature offend an eternal being? It must be that by holding on to false beliefs and telling God what it means to be God, that's where the problem comes in. It's, it's, it's in these egoic human concepts and human ideas where the guilt arises. God doesn't have anything, God doesn't even know about guilt. God didn't set up his law of love and say, now, if you break this, law of love that I'm giving you, I'm going to be really pissed off and I'm going to punish you. Uh, I'm going to punish you for, for messing with my law of love. No, the law of love is the only law there is. You can't really violate it in truth. You can only seem to believe things that are not in line with it 
And in awareness, as a human being, you could seem to feel guilt when you're trying to perpetuate beliefs that God didn't create and doesn't even know about. It's like a, a, a self-inflicted hallucination that you can end at any second. You don't have to continue to believe in these things. Wouldn't it be nice to be in a state of mind where you didn't even believe in friendship or reciprocity? You didn't believe in medicine. You didn't believe in reciprocity, economics. Med you know, all these laws. What about a state of mind where you didn't really believe in money? You didn't even believe in money. That the spirit could use it as part of the dance, but you didn't believe that it was anything positive or negative. It was just part of the dance. It was like leaves blowing in the wind, you know. You, you weren't looking at those leaves blowing in the wind and saying, oh, that looks like gain over there, and oh, that's lost there. You, you imagine how crazy that is if, if you had a tree that had hundreds of leaves, and suddenly there's a big gust of wind that comes and blows, we'll say, several hundred leaves off the tree. Do you really think the tree is going, oh my, I'm so sad. I've just lost 300 leaves. <laughs> Do you really think the tree is thinking that it's lost 300 leaves? Now human beings seem to believe in this thing of gain and loss and reciprocity and scarcity and everything, but again, those are ego beliefs. Those are not laws, the one law of, of love, the, the law of God. Those, that's why we have to relinquish, we have to let go of believing in those things. And I absolutely love these kind of, of lessons because to me they're very practical. I like to be able to be shown specifically what is it that I believe in that's holding me back from knowing who I am, from holding me back from divine providence. The simple lesson is, I am under no laws but God's, but it's a very practical lesson and it's asking us to be very practical in our application, to not hold on to any private thoughts or beliefs. And for me, the whole point of this has been to come into a state of mind that would be in alignment with just pure being, just being as God created me not trying to perpetuate a false sense of separation from God, but to actually yield, to surrender back into this divine flow. The last thing I want to mention to you is, I want to just jump to the teacher's manual, and we talked about trust yesterday and how important trust was and, and the development of trust. We even said that could be our next Maybe I'm dipping into our... Right, dipping into I'm, I'm going into June. <laughs> Michael's looking at me like, you're right. dipping into Thank June you. there. You're double dipping. <laughs> you're going from divine providence and you're dipping into <laughs> development of trust. But this, we'll just do a quick dip. It's, 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 the, it's, the, it's, number, it's number seven in the characteristics of God's teachers. And... Number seven is generosity. Now generosity would seem to fit with divine providence because if you don't have a sense of need and lack, you're not, you don't have a discontent, you feel fulfilled, you feel in alignment with God and everything, it would seem to be that you would be naturally generous. And um, the thing I like about this particular section is, is that Generosity is something that we want to talk about here, but what Jesus is telling us is the generosity, what we believe generosity is, in terms of the world, is the exact opposite of what it truly is. So our thoughts are so twisted, and our beliefs about ourselves and the world is so twisted that we have completely forgotten what true generosity is. 
And I would say true generosity is a giving heart. It's really a state of mind of being loving, joyful and happy. And it has nothing to do with what we describe and define generosity in terms of material terms. He says, the term generosity has special meaning to the teacher of God. It is not the usual meaning of the word. In fact, it is a meaning that must be learned and learned very carefully. Like all the other attributes of God's teachers, trust, honesty, patience, so on and so forth, ultimately this one rests on trust, for without trust no one can be generous in the true sense. To the world, generosity means giving away in the sense of giving up. So we think of the philanthropists, you know, Carnegie, Ted Turner, There's, there are philanthropists throughout history that have given away lots of money. We call that philanthropy. To the world, generosity means giving away in the sense of giving up. To the teachers of God, it means giving away in order to keep. So it's the opposite of philanthropy. In other words, you would <coughs> Be generous to keep a generous feeling in your heart. You would be generous in giving away to keep it. So the teacher of God is generous out of capital self-interest, out of Christ interest. This does not re refer, however, to the self of which the world speaks. It's not talking about the ego. The teacher of God does not want anything he cannot give away because he rec realizes it would be valueless to him by definition. What would he want it for? So when you approach divine providence, you feel so much love in your heart, so much joy, so much happiness, that you just radiate this happiness. You radiate it to everyone and everything, and that is your generosity. Regardless of you, whether you have money or not, you have the power to radiate the truth of who you are in any circumstance, in any situation, by your attitude. That's why Jesus was talking about the Beatitudes in the Bible. The Beatitudes are radiating this generosity, this love in your heart, and that's how you keep it. That's how you keep it in awareness, is by giving it away. It's so different from our beliefs where we're concerned about giving to get, about money, how much money, how much does it cost. The spirit is not in that frame of mind of looking at cost and, and always equating cost and benefits. How much will it cost? What will be my personal benefit? You know, this is the ego is constantly walking that line of what is the cost, what is the benefit, and true generosity just wells up from your heart. And that's the same with divine providence. When you're in divine providence, you don't have a thought for the cost, a personal cost or a personal benefit. There's not even a thought for it. How relaxing, how peaceful that is to not even think about it. To not even have to think about that. It's not worthy of your holy mind to be preoccupied with idols and images. Imagine going through an entire day where you weren't concerned about a cost or a price, where you weren't trying to figuring out something according to a bank account or a benefit where you could just let go of that that mechanism in there that's just always trying to calculate. The ego is always calculating, calculating. True generosity, true experience of divine providence doesn't have that calculating aspect. Because everything is a dance. Everything is a dance working together for good. It may sound even scary, like, oh my God, you mean if everything's one big dance, then, then I can't control any of it. Yeah, that's scary to the ego, but it's glorious to the spirit. 
And the step in towards that, again, as we've been saying, is guidance. Because if you just start to flow with this guidance, it may seem to be specific at the beginning, like it was for Helen Shuckman with her green pantyhose and her used Borgana coat. But eventually, even those specifics are going to just be part of the dance too. You're not going to be cheering on going, I got the green pantyhose, I got the Borgana coat. Of course, it's fine. You rejoice in those things. It's just a symbol. God loves me. Jesus cares for me. He's going to work me for I don't know how many years to get this right, but he's caring for me <laughs> day by day, moment by moment. He cares about me. Those are symbols dream symbols, and it's important to be convinced that you are loved and you are cared for. That's a, a very big part of divine providence, a feeling in your heart that you are cared for. Well, some of you know Lila passed away recently and, uh, and uh, Lila was there with us uh, on the big island of Hawaii and as soon as she passed away the whole place started to erupt. <laughs> uh, and uh, I was talking, Suava last night was reminding me that uh, the last time that this volcano, this main volcano, active volcano in, in, on the big island of Hawaii erupted was back in 1955. Guess what Lila's year of birth was? 1955. So she was born when it erupted, and when she passed, it erupted again. These are, lava is just idle images. Don't get all worked up about 1300, 1400 degrees lava. It's just images. It's pretty. Pretty colors, oranges, yellows. Lava is not dangerous. It's just, it's fluid. Some people have called me a volcano sometimes, but I'm the I'm like the lava. I'm just fluid. And there wouldn't be any Hawaiian islands anyway without that lava. How do you think the the islands were formed in time and space was the the lava and the and the ocean coming together. That's how we have the land. But Lila was always opening to the truth. And I do remember uh, being there in the campground and, and and I gave a lot of talks there at the monastery and there was one talk I gave where I, Lila's eyes just lit up. I've never seen her eyes so bright and all I said was that you should be clueless, carefree, and cared for. The three C's and she repeated those three words over and over and over. Something lit up when I said, be clueless, carefree, and cared for. Because again, for Lila, I think those three words totally encompassed this feeling of glee that she had, this playful glee in her heart of divine providence. She would sometimes call it divine providence, but she preferred to say, I'm clueless, I'm carefree, and I'm cared for. The, all those aspects are aspects of the divine providence. You cannot think you know something in this world and, and fully be in the full experience of divine providence. You must be clueless of the world. You must be clueless of the, look at all these laws that we've, you must be clueless of nutrition, clueless of medication, you must be clueless of friendship, clueless of good relationships, clueless of economics. You must be clueless of all these things in order to go into the fullness of knowing the actual experience of divine providence. You must be carefree, you know. What did we learn 
to cast to give all our cares to Jesus. Cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. If we cast all of our worries, all of our concerns, all of our cares, we have to give up these crazy beliefs to truly do that, then we'll realize that he cares for you. That's the last part. You can be carefree. You can know that you're cared for when you cast these beliefs, when you cast these idols out of your mind. So that's just a practical experience. And the last thing I just want to read to you from the Course is I remember this struck me so strong. I was doing Lesson 135, which is, if I defend myself, I am attacked. And it was talking about all these beliefs and defense and, and the threats. And it was talking about the body identification. It says, yet it is not the body that can fear nor be a thing of fear. It, meaning the body, has no needs but those which you assign to it. The mind is telling the body what its constraints are. The mind is telling the body what its limits are. The mind assigns needs to the body. The body itself is an image. The body itself is like a puppet, puppet and it doesn't have needs of itself. The mind, the ego, assigns needs to the body. It, meaning the body, needs no complicated health structures of defense, no health-inducing medicine, no care and no concern at all. Defend its life or give it gifts to make it beautiful or walls to make it safe. And you but say your home is open to the thief of time, corruptible and crumbling, so unsafe it must be guarded with your very life. So basically he's reinforcing in this lesson that it's the mind where the solution is the mind where we find the Divine Providence, not in the body. It's nice to have some synchronicities that things are taken care of, but those are little, like little snapshots, little reminders, but it's the mind. We cannot assign it to roles it cannot fulfill, to purposes beyond its scope, to exalted aims which it cannot accomplish. Such attempts, ridiculous yet deeply cherished, are the sources for the many mad attacks you make upon it. For it, meaning the body, seems to fail your hopes, your needs, your values, and your dreams. Now let me find this part in here that talks about healing. A healed mind does not plan. It carries out the plans that it receives through listening to wisdom that is not its own. It waits until it has been taught what should be done and then proceeds to do it. It does not depend upon itself for anything except its adequacy to fulfill the plans assigned to it. And now this is the thing that I could do a whole week retreat on one sentence. I could do an entire week on this one sentence from A Course in Miracles. Because this one sentence points you towards divine providence in the most direct way I've ever experienced. I remember the first time I read this sentence, I had to spend hours and hours and hours in prayer with Jesus going, what are you talking about? One sentence, I remember the first time I read this, I just was like floored. I, I was like, oh my God. That's the only thing I could say after I read this. Because, again, why, why am I stopped for hours on one sentence? It's because, because I'm into practicality. I like those love passages like you do. I like to be told I'm loved. 
but I actually want to know, practically speaking, what is it going to take for me to know who I am and to live in divine providence? Give it to me straight. Let me have it in a practical way. You've got to You've got to explain it to me. Jesus spent a lot of time explaining this one to me as well, because I was like, what's going on here? Here it is. This is the sentence. It's a long sentence too. He's got commas in here. You know, this is probably, he is not, love is all there is. I like that one. But this one has got some commas. And so try to stay with me. <laughs> It's one sentence, but it's got, it's got a couple, it's, it's got two commas in it. It's got two commas, I'm telling you ahead of time, so just so you know. Okay, this is it. Now he starts off, he starts off with something that I desire. I really desire something very deeply, and his first three words are what I desire. That's where he gets my attention. He draws me in with the first three words of the sentence. A healed mind. I'm just like, okay, now you've got my attention. I'm, when he starts off with a healed mind, I'm excited. I'm really excited. A healed mind is relieved of the belief that it must plan. You've got my attention. I have a degree in urban planning. I spent five years, five years in University of Cincinnati to get one degree, Bachelor's of Urban Planning. I spent five years of the Parable of David for this one degree in urban planning, and he's starting off the sentence, a healed mind is relieved of the belief that it must plan. And I'm like, hallelujah. That sounds really good. Comma. Although, it cannot know the outcome which is best, comma, the means by which it is achieved, comma, nor how to recognize the problem that the plan is made to solve. Oh great, that's great. A healed mind is relieved of the belief that it must plan. Just think how Relieved your mind would feel if you never had to make another plan, ever, in, ever, in the rest of your life. You never had to make one more plan. This is paragraph 12 of lesson 135 in the workbook of A Course in Miracles. Now I'm going to go through that sentence again because the first thing is like he's throwing out the cheese. He's giving us the cheese on a string, and he's saying, here, you can have this cheese, but you have to meet these three conditions in order to have the cheese. I like it when Jesus does that, because it's very practical. He's like saying, you can have a healed mind. You just have to meet these three conditions. Let's look at this again. It's only one sentence, but this is the key to the whole course. That's why I could do a, a week retreat on just this one sentence. A healed mind is relieved of the belief that it must plan, although it cannot know the outcome which is best, the means by which it is achieved, nor how to recognize the problem that the plan is made to solve. This is why awakening is so tricky. I get this question all the time. I go around to 40-some countries around the world and they say, listen, if love is real and God is real and awakening is inevitable, why is it so damn difficult and why does it take so long if it's so simple? Love is real, God is real, I am as God created me. Why is awakening to my divine truth, my divine source, why is it so difficult? Why do Course in Miracles teachers, there have been prominent Course in Miracles teachers who have said, don't even think of waking up in this lifetime. Don't even think of it. They've said oh, it's going to take many lifetimes. 
And we're dealing with what seems to be one lifetime from birth to death, and they're saying, don't even think of waking up in a lifetime. They said, if you knew how many lifetimes it took Buddha and Jesus, you would not have such crazy ideas about waking up. This sentence is pointing us in the direction of awakening in a very rapid way, because he's told us a healed mind is relieved of the belief it must plan. You don't ever have to make another plan. You can come into a divine acceptance of who you are, but you must meet three conditions. It cannot know the outcome which is best. Let's take a look at this first condition in terms of divine providence. When I hear people talk about divine providence, I always hear people saying, well, I'll know that I'm living in divine providence when I've got so much money I don't know what to do with it. That will do it. When my bank account has so many zeros on its balance that I don't have to ever think and ever have another concern for money. It would be like saying the, f the wealthiest people in the world are the ones that are living in divine providence. But if you get to know wealthy people, you'll, what is one thing that they think about the most? Money. Money. Fear of losing money. Anybody else? How to make more money. How to make more money. <laughs> how, to how to invest money. How to, how, to, how, to how to maintain the money. <laughs> you know, the ego is going to generate its own money idea money. of a healed money mind. Money. It would say to the ego, a healed mind is a, is a mind that has so much money that it doesn't even have to worry about or think about money anymore. <laughs> There's a celebration going on outside. So again, you see how this relates to the outcome, a bank account with a lot of money. Another way of thinking of it would be a healed mind, the ego would say, is, has got so many possessions that it's not concerned about losing possessions. It's got so many houses, it's got so many clothes, so many shoes many belts, so many everything. It's got so many possessions that it is no longer fearful of losing its possessions. But here Jesus is saying, it, it, the healed mind cannot know the outcome which is best. In other words, he's saying whatever you think of as outcomes of how that div divine providence should look, you will not really know it until you don't think about outcomes anymore. You don't think about the best outcomes. You're not obsessed with good outcomes or bad outcomes. You don't even think about outcomes anymore at all. And you might remember in the early part of the workbook of The Course in Miracles where Jesus says, in no situation do you perceive your own best interest. Remember that one? In no situation do you perceive your own best interest. You see how that relates to what I'm talking about? Because as long as you keep thinking in terms of situations and personal gains and losses and, ooh, that's a good outcome, you. You have a party and the ego says, well, that was a nice party, or that was not a nice party. Here's what went wrong in that party. I didn't like that, that outcome, that outcome. The one person I wanted to show up didn't show up. They spilt the food, they spilt the salad all over the floor. You know, you see how the ego is just going to take everything. Even a party is going to evaluate whether it was a good party or a bad party. Someone, you go out on a date. Let's say you go out on a first date. And to Jesus, it just is what it is. An illusion. But uh, to the ego, it's like it's going to evaluate. 
the outcome of that date. Was it a positive outcome or was it a negative outcome? Because if it was a positive outcome, there probably will be what? A second date. But if it was a negative outcome, that could be the, the last date. You see, it's, it, it's so important to the ego to have to judge situations and judge outcomes. And even with divine providence, you can watch the ego going, oh yeah, divine providence, yeah, yeah, that's okay. We'll let you have a little bit of that. But it's going to try to evaluate the outcome and form of what that divine providence looks like. But it's an experience in your heart. It's an experience in your mind. It's an experience of contentment, of joy, of happiness, of freedom. But it's not an outcome. So that's why the first of the condition is, although it, a healed mind, cannot know the outcome, which is best. But it doesn't stop there. You, that's just the first condition. So first of all, we could say of divine providence, you cannot know the outcome which is best. Second thing is, you cannot know the means by which it is achieved. Okay, what do you think of that? Put that one in your pipe. P smoke that one for a while. You cannot know what? You cannot know the means by which it is achieved. You can hear the ego screaming already. Oh, a lot of good that is. You ca I can't know the means by which it's achieved. That that's like sends you into the circuit breakers because what? We're always trying to find the means, right? I bet some of you even signed up for this online retreat thinking, David is going to give me the means to achieve divine providence. <laughs> Let's see a show of hands. Did anybody sign up for this retreat thinking David will give me the means to achieve. <laughs> there we go. We got some honesty there. There's one. There's Mary. <laughs> and look what I'm, look what I'm, for Roberto. There you go. Very good. That, and now Jesus is telling us all that you can't know the means by which it is achieved. And that's only the second condition. First of all, you can't know the outcome which is best. You can't know the means by which it is achieved. And then here comes number three, nor how to recognize the problem that the plan is made to solve. Oh great! <laughs> on top of that, on top of the first two, I cannot recognize the problem that the plan is made to solve. Because you can see, as long as I'm trying to recognize the problem, I'm not focused on what? Overlooking the problem. I'm not, if I'm looking to recognize the problem, I'm not forgiving the problem. I'm not seeing the Christ that is beyond all problems. I'm not seeing the innocence that's beyond all problems. As long as I'm a problem finder, I'm not going to be an innocence finder. You see? This is deep stuff. This will save thousands of years. That's why I was stuck on this, this uh, one sentence for a long time. I'm like, what? What do you mean? What are you talking about? Tell me. But he's like saying, no, you can't recognize the problem that the plan was meant to solve because the plan is about overlooking the problem. It's not about recognizing problems. It's not about finding faults in your brothers and sisters. It's not about finding fault in your politicians or your governments. It's not about finding fault in your Course in Miracle teachers or your Course in Miracle students. It's, it's about overlooking the error entirely. The Holy Spirit doesn't want us to figure out what the problem is. He wants us to release this grievance that we've had in our mind, this belief in separation, and overlook the problem entirely. In fact, in A Course in Miracles, Jesus says that the Holy Spirit overlooks the defiled altar. 
He says, he says it really plainly. The Holy Spirit overlooks the defiled altar and looks to the light of the atonement. And the atonement is the correction. So the Holy Spirit's function is to overlook the error and see only the correction, the light of the correction. So we are not asked in divine providence to say, oh, there are still our problems. But in some or most cases, I get a quick answer to solve the problem. We're actually drawn to go into a state of mind that is so content, so fulfilled, so completely lit up that we no longer perceive problems at all. That's how high this goes. This isn't about trying to maintain your humanness and to get some divine rays shining on your humanness. This is about giving yourself over, your mind over to the divine light, over to the great rays. That's what revelation is, to let the light reveal itself to you. And, and when you bring the darkness to the light, the darkness disappears. And only light remains, because only light ever was. Everything is light. Everything that God creates is pure light. And so, you see how different that is from trying to say, God, come into my situation. Make me a better human. Shine your heavenly light on my human problems. Because God didn't create human problems. Those are all generated by the error, by the ego. And we're not trying to bring the light into the darkness. We're not trying to light up our humanness. We're actually trying to expose our beliefs in the body, expose our belief in being separate from God, expose all of our weaknesses and frailties to the light of truth, and then they will disappear. That's why we have expression sessions in our retreats. People come and they, they cry and they scream and they let up all their frustrations. They, they have all these thoughts of being unworthy, of being dark, of even being evil. They, they let up all this darkness, all these dark thoughts. And that's their way of offering this, their weaknesses, their frailties, to the Holy Spirit as a gift. Only can you offer these things to the Holy Spirit as a gift. If you try to offer evil to your spouse, do you think that's going to be a gift? No. Come up with a better anniversary gift than evil. Uh, don't, I, no, I don't want to hear your dark thoughts. <laughs> tell me that you love me, but don't tell me your dark thoughts. But the Holy Spirit says, bring me your weaknesses. Bring me your frailties. <laughs> You're in Mexico. <laughs> I like it. We got, we got a little music going on in the background. Bring me your noises, your your celebration, your Cinco de Mayo explosions, <laughs> your, your fireworks. At three in the morning, boom! Bring me your booms. Bring me everything. Bring it all to the light of truth and let it disappear. That's, that's how this works. That's, that's what this is all about.